This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. All right, thank you, Mr. Announcer, and thank you for tuning in to another edition of the Farm Monitor. That is Kenny. I am Ray, and I think you're going to like what we have in store for you today. Mr. Bergamy? Well, here we go. Coming up, with talks of a new farm bill ramping up, we'll hear from American Farm Bureau President Zippy Duval on what it's going to take to get cotton restored to Title I. Also on the program, a new addition to the Farm Monitor team. He's UGA Extension Specialist Paul Baglis, and this month, He's got some tips and tricks on pruning those hydrangeas. And then later. Hey everybody, Ranger Nick coming up. You may know that plants need light, water, and nutrients to survive, but I bet you didn't know that some of those nutrients involve meat. Yes, we're talking about carnivorous plants this month. That and so much more starts right now on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Producing crops in Georgia takes a large investment of time and money. One of the biggest threats to a crop is keeping pests away. And thanks to UGA research, farmers have management strategies to fight insects that can devastate a crop. The Monitor's Mark Wildman has the report. In this small research plot, UGA extension entomologist Stormy Sparks is glad to see a thriving insect population. That is because his goal was to develop solutions to keeping pests like the ones found here away from farmers' fields. My responsibilities are primarily in insect pest management and commercial vegetable production. So we work with a lot of different crops, a lot of different pest systems, uh, and figuring out how just best to manage pests in those crops. Working with vegetables has its challenges. The crop is very expensive to produce, so keeping the pest away is critical to a farmer. Some crops, uh, some row crops, if you get 10% damage, it could be a 10% loss in yield. In some vegetable crops, 10% damage in a field may prevent you from harvesting that field, so you could very easily have 100% loss with very low damage. Every crop of vegetables is different, so research must be conducted on a wide variety of pests. This is uh, collard plants. Uh, this is a test where we're looking at control of caterpillar pests. Uh, so where you see the holes in the leaves, that's where we have failed to control caterpillar pests. Some of the more important ones we deal with are diamondback moth and coal crops. Uh, very well known worldwide for resistance to insecticides. Makes management of that pest uh, very difficult. Silverleaf whitefly in a wide variety of fall crops, we can get huge, huge populations, uh, which makes management of that pest very difficult. And of course, when you are researching a pest, it is nice to see it as you walk through the crop. This is a diamondback moth larvae on, on kale. Uh, that is a pretty much a full grown larvae right there. It may get a little bit fatter than that, but that's about as long as they get. The work being done here is geared for the commercial vegetable grower, and the hope is that every dollar spent on research returns many more to the economy. So it is critical to stay one step ahead of the insects. Generally when you deal with a new pest, your first thing that you look for is what insecticides can we control it with? Short term answers. How can we produce the crop, uh, manage the pest and produce the crop? Uh, and then once you found those solutions, you start looking at what are the alternatives we can do as well. Now, if there's something glaring that's very easy to do, uh, we, we'll implement that immediately. But, and usually that's insecticides. But then you start looking at host preferences, biological control, you know, what, what can we do other than insecticides that will help manage the pest. If it wasn't for good research, Georgia would not have a strong vegetable growing industry. And thanks to entomologists like Stormy Sparks, not only does good research get conducted, but the information gets to the growers quickly. Reporting from Tifton, I'm Mark Wildman for the Georgia Farm Monitor. In other ag news, changes in the tax code, immigration reform, and the impending farm bill. Issues that Farm Bureau is knee deep in right now, and they're urging you, the farmer, to contact your local representative to engage in conversation on these issues as well as others. Our cotton producers are no exception. 
Recently, we posed the question to AFBF President Zippy Duval after cotton was taken out of Title I of the Farm Bill to comply with the World Trade Organization decision. What, if anything, can be done to restore it? During the last Farm Bill, Congress and the cotton producers worked together to create what we know as the Stacks Program. And after experiencing Stacks, we've realized that it's not being effective a safety net for our cotton producers. Uh, so we're going to we're looking forward to the opportunity to work with Congress to uh, to make uh, cotton seed uh, considered as an other oil seed and put it back in Title One and be considered under ARC and PLC. Uh, and we look uh, look forward to the revenue discussions that they're having in a new revenue bill that's coming up that they might go ahead and make some changes. But what we need to remember is that the farm bill is a safety net for our producers. And when the Title I uh, programs are not working for a commodity, we need to have the opportunity to go back and fix those programs so that those farmers have a true safety net. In the meantime, with planting season in full swing, there are a number of things for farmers to worry about. But the most important, of course, is the weather. The Monitor's Damon Jones recently spoke with the climatologist from the National Weather Service. No matter how much time or effort farmers put into planting their fields, the ultimate success or failure of their crop will depend mainly on an always fickle mother nature. That's why the work being done here at the National Weather Service in Peachtree City is so important, as it uses the most up-to-date equipment to provide producers with an accurate forecast. We use a whole gamut of technology, from new satellite te technology, uh, also to radar technology, and then, of course, the computer models that help simulate uh, many, many math equations uh, in the atmosphere. And all that data is pretty obvious when walking into the weather station as you're greeted by walls of screens, each with its own purpose. Uh, well, just recently, uh, there's a lot of severe weather that was going on, so we were issuing all types of warnings, including tornado warnings and severe thunderstorm warnings. But aside from that, we're forecasting seven days out, and we're also looking at the river levels and, and also routine climate data. After those storms, farmers are looking for a routine spring and summer, and right now the forecast is relatively mild. The spring is looking to be above normal temperatures, but you've got a good equal chance of, of any type of precipitation. We just don't see a clear signal yet if it's going to be wetter or drier than normal. Temperature wise, it's about a 50% chance for above normal. However, the news isn't all good as farmers should be on the lookout for some stretches of really dry conditions. I would plan for a probably a persisted drought that we're in right now. Uh, much of North Georgia is actually in the moderate to extreme drought conditions and that's long term. Uh, once you go farther into central Georgia, we're talking a short term drought, but that's abnormally dry. However, that initial forecast is anything but set in stone. Just like predicting anything, weather forecasting is an inexact science, especially looking several months into the future. Months in advance, it gets pretty tricky. Uh, thankfully, we do have some other global models that we use specifically for climate uh, forecasting. What we end up doing as far as that goes, we look at a lot of large scale circulation trends, which can be something that's halfway across the globe. And we monitor these trends and a lot of that goes into uh, departures from normal, whether it's temperature or precipitation. Reporting from Peachtree City, I'm Damon Jones for the Georgia Farm Monitor. Damon, thank you so much. Well, if you're confused about when to prune and not to prune or how much to prune, don't sweat it. After the break, the Monitor's new gardening expert, Paul Puglise, will fill you in on all the tips and tricks. Extension Corner, that is next when the Georgia Farm Monitor continues. I'm Don McGew. I'm Director of Commodities and Marketing here at the Farm Bureau. I've had the privilege and the pleasure to work here for over 37 years. Uh, the big thing I like about my job is I get the opportunity to work uh, directly with farmers. It's been a great job. I've enjoyed it. Uh, certainly enjoyed working with um, all the different agricultural groups. Uh, I grew up on a farm. Um, so I have a, a real passion for working with agriculture and working with farmers. I understand many of their problems and a lot of the issues that they face out there on the farm. Uh, you know, I've never really had a day 
unlike some people, uh, that I get up and say, my goodness, I've got to go to work. Uh, because I know that um, it's always been a challenge. There's always things to do representing agriculture and representing farmers. I guess uh, one thing that stands out is uh, my relationship to peanuts uh, and working with, with the peanut uh, uh, farmers and the Peanut Commission and others that have been involved in peanuts. You know, when you come from Georgia, everybody expects you to know something about peanuts and be involved with peanuts. And I've really, really uh, enjoyed that. Uh, first class folks uh, and just been a real pleasure. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm gonna miss the people. Uh, the organization certainly, it's been great. Um, the, doing a little, a little bit of traveling, uh, the other relationships. But, but, but the actual people is what I'm going to miss. The recently retired Don Magoo, we of course wish him nothing but the best. Mm -hmm. Well, a new face here at the Monitor, UGA Extension Agent Paul Puglis. Yeah, Ray, Paul recently came on board as the show's gardening guru. Today, he tackles the always popular task of plant pruning. Hi, I'm Paul Puglis with the University of Georgia Cooperative Extension. Today we're going to talk a little bit about pruning hydrangeas. I get a lot of questions about pruning hydrangeas because it's kind of confusing sometimes as to when is the best time to prune and how do you still get flowers out of those plants if you prune at the proper time. So the first question you really should be asking is why prune at all? There's a lot of different hydrangea varieties on the market today that you can, you can put them in a space that you never really have to prune them. This is a good example of a big leaf hydrangea that's planted in front of somebody's porch. This is about as big as they get, and if it's got enough space to grow, you really shouldn't have to prune them a whole lot. People that actually want to prune a lot of times are trying to keep a cat in a bag. You know, it's not maybe a big enough space to be able to grow that plant. So maybe it's not the best plant for that particular situation. So a lot of people are familiar with the big leaf hydrangea varieties. And these are varieties that have these big, beautiful blooms that can come in pinks and whites, reds and blues. And these are the ones that usually bloom in late spring through early summer. Um, so these, are blo these bloom on actually old wood that was set for, with flower buds the previous year. Another common type of hydrangea is the oak leaf. The oak leaf hydrangea is another one that actually blooms on old wood in early spring and, and, and late summer. And so this is one that you don't want to prune, just like the big leaf hydrangea varieties. You don't want to prune these until after they bloom. The third type of hydrangea I don't have with me today is a type that's uh, called the smooth hydrangea or the panicle type of hydrangeas. And those types of hydrangeas actually bloom in, in the late summer into the fall. And those you don't want to prune after they bloom in the summer because you'll cut off those flower buds. The best time to prune those is actually in the winter time. Now I will mention that these all get different sizes. The big leaf hydrangeas like this one only get about three to five feet tall at most. The oak leaf hydrangeas can get six to eight feet tall, so make sure you've got a space big enough for an oak leaf hydrangea if you're going to grow one of those in the shade. And then the panicle types of hydrangeas, some of the popular varieties like the limelight variety and the PG variety, can get anywhere from 15 to 20 feet tall. So that's a big hydrangea that you've got to have space for. And again, you can prune those in the wintertime if you need to, and they'll still flower. Okay? So this is a good example of a hydrangea that's coming out of dormancy right now. And so this is a question that we get. Well, what should I prune and how much? Well, generally speaking, this time of year, again, you don't want to cut off those flower buds that are starting to form. So you want to only take off the dead stuff. So go in here and just pull off these old dead blooms. And this is a great time to look and see where's the new growth coming out. If you don't see any new growth all the way back to this point, that's where you want to cut the dead stuff off, okay? So make sure you're only cutting the dead stuff and it will still be able to set those blooms. So it's really just a matter of getting in here and cleaning up the plant. And again, all you're doing is cutting out the dead stuff. You're not doing any hard pruning on this plant. And hopefully it'll continue to bloom normally uh, later this spring and into the summer. Now, if you did need to take it back a lot harder and, and, and make it smaller as an overall plant, again, the best time to do that is immediately after it flowers. And generally, you want to do that type of really hard pruning before August 1st, so it'll still be able to set buds that'll bloom on time next year. One problem that we commonly see with hydrangeas is some people say, well, it didn't bloom at all this year, and I didn't prune it, okay? I did what I was supposed to be doing. So in those situations, it may be that we had a really hard winter. In North Georgia, a couple years ago, we had a really, really hard winter where we got down into some single digit temperatures. Those temperatures were actually cold enough to actually damage the buds and the canes that had already set flower buds the previous year. So in those cases, we call that winter pruning. And that plant's gonna have to grow back from the root system, and it will, but it won't have enough growth to be able to produce flower buds the next year. 
One other thing that I would mention as far as maintaining hydrangeas is, well, how should I fertilize them? If you want to increase the blooms, we recommend a balanced fertilizer like a, an 888 or a 101010 10 fertilizer. And you can actually put as much as a pint of fertilizer, which is basically half of this cup right here. A pint is all you need uh, to fertilize about 100 square feet in, the, in your landscape. So a 10 by 10 area, that's how much fertilizer you need to, to uh, fertilize these types of hydrangeas. And again, you might want to space that out, do an application in March, another one in May and July. Again, spring and early summer are the times that you really want to focus on building those flower buds and those blooms for next year as well. And the last tip I would give you is, is how to water these. Hydrangeas require a lot of water. And so when you water these, it's important that you water them early in the morning. And the reason why is they're very susceptible to leaf spot diseases called Cercospora and powdery mildew. And if you water them late in the day, those leaves will stay wet way too long and they'll actually get disease if they stay wet all night long. So again, the best time to water these is early in the morning so those leaves will dry out more quickly and you can avoid a lot of disease problems with these plants. So for more information, uh, contact your local county extension office or go to our website at ugaextension.org or be sure to follow us on the Georgia Farm Monitor. All right, welcome Paul and great job. Now just a reminder, if you missed any part of the story or others on today's program, you can still see them in their entirety at our YouTube channel. That is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Once there, browse the archive of stories dating as far back as 2009. And once you're done watching all those informative stories, just keep clicking. Like the Georgia Farm Monitor Facebook page we have set up for you. Also, folks, if you have a story idea or you just want to leave us a comment or suggestion, Feel free, send us a message either on Facebook or at the address you see there on the screen. That is news at farm-monitor.com. Hey everybody, coming up, three words, meat eating plants <laughs> on the other side of this. Hey everybody, Ranger Nick stepping inside of a greenhouse over here on the campus of the University of Georgia in a place where a bug would never want to land. That's right, I'm surrounded by those carnivorous plants that we talked about a little earlier, and I'm hanging out today with Mr. Kevin Tarner. Kevin is a student of mine, actually, and is a plant technician, research technician here at the University of Georgia, and Kevin knows a thing or two about these carnivorous plants. First, Kevin. What kind of things go on in a greenhouse like this regarding teaching that the public may not know? That's a good question. A lot of things actually go on uh, teaching, re uh, teaching related activities here. This place is a living natural history museum okay. and it, the plants here sample a lot of biodiversity that you'll find all across the world and we have it all in one place. And so what we're able to do using that is we're able to get tour groups in here of students. We've even had artists and poets from UGA and we've had K through 12 audiences and we have a lot of people who come and they see these things sometimes for the very first time in their life. Um, at this place. We have orchids, we have carnivorous plants, we have um, primitive land plants, we have a desert collection and a rainforest collection. So all of these things are very useful to supply, let's say, scientists with the materials that they need to do research as well as showcase in an educational way how plant diversity is a spectacular thing and um, is really capable of giving students a lot of enjoyment. Well, Kevin, that's really neat. What I want to do now is show the folks at home some of the unbelievable ways that these carnivorous plants feed on meat and feed on insects. So let's check it out. Like something out of a sci-fi movie. Take a look at this. Kevin the Plant Man, we've been talking about carnivorous plants and these things eating meat. I don't see any teeth on them. Kevin, how are they doing this? How are they getting insects? Well, that's a neat question. These guys right here are pitcher plants. They're a carnivorous plant that is actually native to the swampy, nutrient-poor habitats of Georgia. And they're able to eat bugs in a variety of different ways. Um, the first thing that they're able to do that no other plant can do is they're able to attract prey. And they do this with bright coloration. And as you can see here on this yellow pitcher plant, it is beaded with a nectar that the plant is producing. So they're mimicking the things that flowers normally do to attract insects. It turns out that insects happen to be one of the best natural sources of plant fertilizer. Now, by making the nectar, which is laced with a paralytic drug, which um, gets the bugs kind of lazy and increases the chance that they fall into the tubes, they're able to change color. This, this guy's white, it's a white pitcher plant, and it shows up best at night because it is a specialist moth hunter. So they're Jeez, able to do a lot of neat things. 
The second kind of carnivorous oh, plant. This, this is, I, I think I know what this is. This is Venus flytrap. Yeah, but now, that's right. Kevin, when I see on TV, these are like huge and they're eating small children. Is that, <laughs> like this, is this full grown? Well, what is this? Sorry to burst your bubble, but that is actually not the case here. Okay. All of okay. these plants are actually just after insects and the enzymes that they make to digest them work best and almost only on insects. Jeez. So if you want to take a, Right, let's try if you this. want to prove that for yourself, let's if you'll just hit it. one of those traps where let's it turns pink, it. see if we let's can if this guy get it to chomp food. on you. Let's see. Come on, little buddy. Oh, let's see. They're so well fed here at that's Georgia. That's true. They don't even need any fingers <laughs> like Ranger Dick. That's good. probably try this guy. Interesting. Man, that's cool. Let, let's walk yeah. down here. You've got some awesome. Venus flytrap. And then you, what else you got sitting well, down here? This third, is wild. Third kind of plant that we've got here is a plant called a sundew, and now we have native species of these as well. But one thing that they do really well is they secrete a glue on their leaves that traps flying prey like flies and gnats. Mm. Now, once that glue holds on to a bug, the entire leaf bends and is capable of movement so that it secures the bug down and forms a little bug taco, pinches it down, and then it will digest it right there on the spot. A bug taco. Incredible. Folks, did you know that plants were this smart? Kevin, the plant man, bringing us up to speed on this. I want to show you next, if you're looking to do this at home, how can you do it? How can you grow one of these in your own house? Let's check it out. There are a number of different basics about carnivorous plants that are a little bit different than normal plants, but once you get over the hang of that, they become very easy to grow, even easier than most plants. The first thing that they need is very bright sunlight. They're okay. used to swamps without a whole lot of tree cover, and so shade they don't really like that. The second thing is that they need a lot of water. So they're swamp plants, and as long as they're kept moist at all times, they'll survive just fine. Okay. The third thing that I always recommend is that you need a special soil to plant them in. Normal fertilizer like miracle Grow, it burns the roots off of these things. Wow. They're not very well adapted to experiencing those nutrients. Okay. And so what, you, what I've got here are some simple basic ingredients. Okay. The first, is an ingredient called peat moss. Okay. And what it, is, what it consists of is just a dried moss called sphagnum and it keeps the pH in a good range. And it actually, I've got some moist moss here. It holds a lot of water. <laughs> and so that is the property that you really want with this kind of environment. And the second component just adds structure and drainage is sand. And so when you put those two together, you get right what I call muck. Okay. So this is swamp muck. And that's what you're gonna plant these guys in. Okay. We actually, um, you can get all the ingredients for about $25, and then a plant of this size, they're very slow growing, will cost you about $25 as well. So for about 50 bucks, you can put this thing together. And it's just as simple as getting one of these guys in the mail, okay. turning it over, checking that the plant is healthy, but then you can plant it in a nice little bowl there and scoop some of this lovely muck in, make it nice and happy. Oh, love that. And love then you're it. pretty much done. And this is a plant that actually can live outside and experience the cold and the heat as long as it's kept moist, well lit, and there you go. You have a basic bog garden in a bowl right here. So instead of the fly swatter, you put one of these out and it's going to attract all the insects. This is incredible. Thanks, plant man. Great. So if you're an insect, you definitely don't want to make your way into this greenhouse. But as the plant man Kevin has, a little green and all, he made his way in because he's looking for that good meat just like all these other carnivorous plants are. Plant man, thank you so much today for hanging out with me. You did a phenomenal job. Learned a lot of great things about carnivorous plants. And I hope maybe you'll take a chance to plant some at your own home. You know what to do. Hop online, check out the Georgia Farm Monitor Facebook page. And while you're at it, Check out the Ranger Nick Facebook page and find out what I'm up to. And until next time, for the Farm Monitor, I'm Ranger Nick reminding you that enthusiasm is contagious. So pass it on. Y'all, thanks so much for watching. We'll look forward to seeing you right back here again next month. See ya. Nick, thank you so much. That is going to do it for this week's edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. Just a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm, be sure and check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming and the Farm Monitor show. Take care, everybody. We will see you next week right here on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Have a great week.